Hello, I hope you are well. This is going to be the unit one review video um, for basic economic concepts. So I said at the outset that unit one was going to be sort of the most boring of the units, um, but it was going to be one of the most important because it really allows us to build the foundational skills that are necessary uh, to proceed forward with the course and to really delve into some of the interesting social problems and topics uh, that I know a lot of you had expressed interest in. So specifically, we're going to talk about um, the opioid epidemic and the affordable housing crisis. This is a great book evicted written by a Princeton sociologist, Matthew Desmond, that also won the uh, Pulitzer Prize about the affordable housing crisis. And of course, unfortunately, we're also going to be talking about this horrific opioid um, epidemic. And um, the goal is similar to um, government. Um, I know that government was, the social problems were executed a bit more unevenly, um, just because obviously this is my first year teaching both these courses. Um, I am not new to the material by any means, but it's um, obviously a sort of process determining uh, how to roll out material and, 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 and pitch it to students and make it digestible and stuff like that. So hopefully, uh, my planning will allow us to touch uh, these topics. Specifically, the goal is to um, uh, use microeconomics to better understand these sort of social problems and then use these social problems to better uh, understand microeconomics. And also, hopefully, by, by, by the end of it, um, to use microeconomics to come up with sort of solutions or our own um, policy proposals so to speak, uh, to solve these sorts of problems. Uh, we also will be talking about poverty. Um, we're going to be talking about the Washington, Washington consensus or the forced privatization of um, um, socialist economies and, and um, heavy, heavy government uh, or economies that featured heavy government intervention um, and sort of the, the um, backlash and, and the the uh, backlash to it. Um, we're obviously going to talk, I already said extreme poverty. This is a really great book by Catherine B Boo about Behind the Beautiful Forever. It's about a slum in India. Um, we're going to talk about climate change, and we're also going to use economics to describe and explain the behavior of uh, states and countries. And so the reason why I presented you with that slide of what we're going to uh, you know, the breadth of the kind of social uh, phenomenon uh, um, uh, phenomena that we will be um, uh, studying in economics is because I know that there are a lot of misconceptions about the study of economics. A lot of us think economics and we think financial literacy or dollar bills, and that's incorrect. Economics is the study of the choices that individuals, businesses, governments, and entire societies make as they cope with scarcity and the incentives that influence and reconcile those choices. So it's how individuals, businesses, governments wrestle with scarcity, wrestle with the fact that our unlimited desire for goods and services exceeds our limited ability to produce goods due to constraints on time and resources. There are two branches of economics. There is macroeconomics, which is the study of the national global economy or the national or the global economy as a whole. So in macroeconomics, oftentimes um, students wrestle with questions relating to unemployment and inflation, uh, stuff that affects the macroeconomy and sort of the um, policy mechanisms that exist uh, for the government to correct for bouts of um, low economic growth or even negative economic growth and so forth. Microeconomics, in contrast, is the study of individual components of the economy, uh, individuals, firms, um, and, and uh, governments, and how these individual components interact in the economy. Um, economics is called the dismal science, and this relates to this word, scarcity. It's called the dismal science because it tells you you can't have it all. That given conditions of scarcity, given worlds of scarcity, and here's a kind of dramatic example of a world of scarce resources, you can't have it all. There are trade-offs to be made. 
and that there's no such thing. This is a famous line. There's no such thing as a free lunch. No such thing. You're trading off something. You're giving away time. You're giving up something. We live in a world of scarcity. And so fundamentally, economics is the study of how we allocate scarce resources. How do we allocate um, resources uh, given conditions of scarcity? Um, so we talked about this concept of opportunity cost. I introduced to you this at the beginning, um, but we really kind of to delve, we delved deep into this when we started um, drawing production possibilities from tiers. And here's a picture of Emperor Palpatine. You must choose. Right. And the idea is of an opportunity cost is that for everything you do, there is a cost. There's an imp there are explicit costs, and we'll talk more about that later, accounting versus economic costs. But very important to economists, probably one of the most important costs to economists is the opportunity cost. The, that is the value of the best foregone alternative that you did not choose. So we'll talk more about that when we get into production possibilities frontiers. The two actors in microeconomics, and we also said, we usually we're gonna deal with consumers and producers. Um, We'll talk more about this later. We assume consumers have budget constraints and that they want to maximize utility or usefulness, value, happiness, benefit, and producers will assume that they want to maximize profit um, um, and consider to, in maximizing profits, they consider the demand of consumers and input costs. We're also going to add, um, because we're going to use game theory to describe uh, the behavior of states, uh, governments as well. In unit one, we also, um, when we determine comparative advantage, we also kind of wrestle a little bit with international trade. This we'll talk about later. We said that economics is a social science because it uses scientific approaches, right? You, an economist um, necessarily constructs hypotheses. Um, we are going to be wrestling with a lot of theories in economics, a lot of theories that are considered, you know, robust, uh, well supported by the evidence. Um, you have to test your hypothesis and refine your hypothesis. But in contrast to natural or hard sciences, where one can run what is called an RCT or a randomized controlled experiment or a randomized controlled trial, um, where, uh, for example, a drug trial where you have a treatment group, um, people that get a specific, so we can imagine the coronavirus vaccine, people that get a the Pfizer vaccine, and then a placebo group, a control group, or people that don't. Um, RCTs are much harder to run in economics. Um, so it's a more precarious science, and I'll expand upon this a little bit more in a little bit. And economists are therefore stuck trying to look for natural experiments. Right, it's a little bit more precarious. They're looking for natural experiments. Uh, they're looking for uh, variations in terms of governmental policy. They're looking for uh, uh, economists use all sorts of statistical tools that you're learning in AP statistics, regression analysis, all sorts of stuff. And um, they are, economists are looking for natural experiments, right? Experiments, um, they're looking to observe phenomena, um, phenomenon, phenomena, I don't know what the plural is, in society um, and looking for natural experiments, so to speak. And so the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because this is the AP government concept, hashtag AP gov. We said this principle of federalism, the sharing of power between this, the, um, the local governments and state governments and the federal and national government um, can produce inequalities in domains where the powers are reserved for the state governments. So specifically, an economist might, um, you know, it's particularly, uh, an economist might want to study the effects of minimum wage, right? The effects of minimum wage on employment. And the great thing about our federalist system is that there are different uh, sorts of wages, right? The minimum wage in Texas is what, 750 The minimum wage in Washington, D.C., where I used to live, I think it was like 14 bucks or 12 bucks or whatever. And so an economist would definitely uh, be looking at sort of 
uh, policies that raise the minimum wage, maybe in Texas, if there was a law that passed that raised the minimum wage, uh, to try to determine what would the effect on output be. And so our federalist system is actually um, very uh, beneficial to um, economists um, um, uh, because it allows them to look for natural experiments within the system. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to mention too uh, is that in economics, testing is more challenging, or I'm sorry, that um, the rise of big data, you know, data collected by private companies like Facebook and Google, and then tax record data, national data, um, has allowed economists economics to become even more sciencey, so to speak. Um, there's this great course um, called Using Big Data to Solve Social and Econ Economic and Social Problems. It's um, you can find it on YouTube. Um, it's taught by Raj Chetty, who's an economist at Harvard University and check it out. OK, and he goes over like all the statistical approaches um, that incidentally uh, Ms. Flores is teaching you, so you can use it to help you review some econ and statistics crossover. Um, we talked about this in class. I don't want to go into this. Theory. Oh, yes. So mm, the principles of economics, we're going to be wrestling with a lot of microeconomic theories, um, and we're just going to uh, explain the theories, right? Um, we're going to use a lot of models uh, to kind of show you really like the essential principles of microeconomics. What are um, the sort of, um, you know, what's the logic of, of microeconomics? What is sort of considered robust theory um, and, and stuff like that? And um, uh, it's very much introductory level, right? You're not expected to um, use a bunch of like the sort of statistical and mathematical tools that you can expect that you would need to use if you're an economics major and you're taking econometrics, right? Um, so we're not going to really focus a lot on empirical analysis. We're going to, um, you know, uh, adopt a lot of the theory that has uh, come to us, um, you know, after economists have wrestled over time with intense theoretical debates predicated on empirical data. Um, but yeah, just know that. OK, this is the first big thing that you probably need to know. This should be a V. Normative versus positive, and this is a recap. So normative statements, and we can distinguish between statements, and it doesn't have to be normative statements it, solely in economics, normative statements anywhere, or questions. Describe what should be or ask what should be. They involve value judgments, so they might be influenced by ideology. They cannot be proven right or wrong and cannot be disputed with data. So a, an example of a normative question would be something like, what should the minimum wage be? The minimum wage should be 15 an hour. So normative and positive statements and um, questions, um, they are often, often kind of times, you know, it's hard, or they're often kind of times, um, you know, in an economic paper, assuming in a world where you're going to Georgetown University majoring in economics, actually, uh, let's, let's say you're going to Princeton and major in economics, uh, normative and positive statements, um, you can find a bunch in, in um, an economic paper and an economic analysis. The interesting thing about the economics profession that we also said a lot about is the economics profession is very much um, seen as very prestigious. We talked about how it's one of the most pop economics, is one of the po most popular majors in the Ivy League, if not the most popular major in the, yeah, probably the most popular major in the Ivy League. Um, but there is a council of economic advisors that advises the president in terms of creating policy. There is um, the Federal Reserve Board, um, which isn't necessarily 
uh, which control interest rates and have a dual man we have a dual mandate that our reserve board or central banking system in our country which is tasked with keeping inflation under control and keeping unemployment below a certain level and they do this by um, lowering interest rates and the mechanisms that they use to lower interest rate that's that's ap microeconomic stuff or macroeconomic stuff and we also have of course this treasury secretary and you know these offices with the exception of the CEA, don't necessarily need to be manned by economists, but they often kind of are, like the bureaucracy is comprised of a lot of economists. Um, they have huge influence in terms of policy making in the United States. The Council of Economic Advisors, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors has the president's ear in terms of economic and social policy in the United States. Having said that, um, there is a sort of in economic papers, in economic reports, maybe government reports, there may be a collection of normative statements about what should be, what should happen, and there also may be a collection of positive statements that are imbued within the same sort of paper, right? So there may be positive evidence and positive statements that are meant to support normative statements and claims or to help us answer normative questions. So an example of a positive statement could be um, about the minimum wage. The minimum wage, if raised to, would decrease employment in the retail industry by x percent right and so this positive statement would need to be supported by data obviously an economist would um, try to support this positive statement if they're making this positive statement with their data and their and their sort of model um, but but uh, for our purposes this um, positive statement um, doesn't necessarily have to be true right? It doesn't necessarily have to be true. You could dispute it because we said that um, econo economics is very much a social science, but unlike a hard science where, you know, there are, there's a, a considerably more, there's a considerably greater measure of certainty in terms of things. Um, for example, the law of gravity, you know, is pretty certain, uh, uh, negative 9.81 meters per second squared, or, 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 or did I get that right? I don't know. But a social science, um, there's a little bit more ambiguity because naturally social scientists have to include a lot more assumptions in their sort of models. Um, they, you know, it's harder to predict uh, society-wide uh, phenomena, um, you know, the data, it's harder to, um, causal inference is, is very difficult. We can use a variety of statistical uh, tools to try to de determine causation um, and we want to make sure that we're not confusing correlation with causation which is, is is very hard and all sorts of stuff um so positive statements in economics uh, certainly can be disputed um, there are, are all sorts of arguments that are happening in economics and really in all sciences too um, that take place because science is very much an intellectual and practical activity um, that involves, you know, oftentimes disagreements and, and eventually hopefully consensus. Okay. But the positive statement that you create here is in theory for an economist might support their normative statement an economist I might also just make that positive statement and then might not offer is issue any suggestions or policy recommendation but certainly an economist at the a center or the um cea the center for economic advisors in, in the white house certainly they're expected to make a lot of normative statements and, and to support him with positive statements. And sometimes, uh, you know, the president has a lot of normative values and that goes into the selection of the specific economists that chair the CEA and, and, and that obviously influences uh, data collection and stuff like that. Okay, cool. 
factors of production, go ahead and take a or uh, pause the video. Uh, remember the different factors of production. This one is very important. Capital is the wealth used to create other wealth, and we said that um, specifically um, it's wealth that needs to be scaled to a certain degree to be able to compete in an actual economy for us to be considerate capital. And so you can think of it as wealth used to create other wealth, you know, tractors, maybe trailer trucks, you know, carrying different goods and services, um, you know, bank deposits, um, IPOs, all sorts of stuff that can be considered capital, natural resources, land and entrepreneurship, all that good stuff, all that jazz. Most factors of production are scarce, but some factors of production, such as established knowledge, may not be scarce due to their non-rival nature. I'm not going to go into this, but just read the slide, take a picture. Difference between rivalrous versus non-rivalrous uh, resources. Um, we're going to come back to this when we get into public goods at the end of the course. Again, we said capital is accumulated wealth of an individual company. Or, uh, uh, w wealth in any form used to produce more wealth. Wealth used to create more wealth scaled to a certain degree. Um, yeah, capitalism, and this is something that I wanted to distinguish early on. Capitalism is a pejorative, meaning it's actually a negative term uh, given to it by its critics, right? So we often talk at times associate capitalism, we use it interchangeably with free market economics and stuff like that. But capitalism describes a system that relies heavily on the private use of capital. So the private ownership of the factors of production, private ownership of, of, uh, of capital, I should say, private ownership of the factories, um, uh, private ownership of the steamships, of the railroads. Um, so, you know, the term capitalism uh, was used to describe um, a economic and political system that um, critics uh, that developed in during the Industrial Revolution that critics, uh, you know, wanted to disparage and it has since stuck. Now people call themselves capitalists and they identify as capitalists, all that good stuff. Capitalism need not go with democracy, um, nor cap nor democracy uh, need not, or um, nor um, um, capital itself can be can be used in the creation of or capital itself. I'm sorry, capital itself um, is used by fascistic societies, socialistic societies, all that store stuff. Wealth used to create other wealth. But capitalism, um, and this is an important distinguishment, just describes a system that relies heavily on the private use and ownership of capital. Okay, cool. Talk about the distinguishment between market economy command economy later. This gets us into resource allocation and economic systems. We watched this really lovely video by Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman is a Nobel Prize winning economist that was very influential into the economic uh, thinking of Alan Greenspan and, and, and um, Ronald Reagan. Um, and so he kind of, you know, really is trying to talk a lot about, and he, he Milton Friedman is what is called, he's in the Chicago School of Economics. The Chicago School of Economics are people from the University of Chicago, famous economists um, that oftentimes are really, really pro market, pro, pro, pro market. And that's we'll see that the market can do a lot of good things. The free market, I should say, can do a lot of good things. Um, and we'll kind of try to I'll try to spell out the logic a little bit in this video, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, because I want to reserve the majority of the time in this video to actually modeling, um, you know, op optimal decision making and and or, or determining um, the decision making of a rational agent and 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 um, finding opportunity costs and, and comparative advantage. But um, you know, Milton Friedman did talk, and he he kind of suggested that the free market, and you know, which is often used synonymously with capitalism, which is OK. Um, he talks about the pencil and he talks about the different inputs and the different people that are involved in the creation of the pencil, the the sort of the graphite, the the wood, the paint, the, the eraser, all of that. And he really kind of shows how marvelous 
how, how much poetry um, um, really is involved in the creation of a simple pencil and then how cheap it is, right? And he attributes a lot of this to the free market, but some of the aspects of a market system that he really does, um, you know, uh, or features of a market system that he identifies as specialization, right? He says that there are going to be people that specialize in uh, producing a certain aspect of this pencil and that increased specialization he is he claims is a feature of the market economy, but also leads to greater productivity um, and um, and um, of course social welfare because now you're able to buy this pencil at a cheap price. He doesn't really explain the logic very well in the video and how he arrives at that, but the Hayek piece that we did read on knowledge and society um, does explain the logic. The fundamental questions of microeconomics are what goods and services should be produced, how to produce those goods and services, and who gets those goods and services. And so the ways that historically um, they have been solved, or these or I'm sorry, these questions have been addressed, is historically all economic decisions have to be, uh, have been or in some societies, economic decisions across time have been made centrally by an individual or small number of individuals on behalf of a larger group. So think agrarian societies. You know, you might have um, a very small tribe um, that where there are production and consumption decisions being made uh, centrally, or you might have like a very small um, you know, a family that is literally just producing and consuming whatever it may, or I'm sorry, consuming whatever it produces. There's no excess. Um, there's no exchange of resources and all that sorts of stuff. Um, and in, But of course, these have fallen out of favor. But in communist societies, in communist countries, there's central bureaucratic committee established that establishes production targets for the country's farms and factories that develop a master plan. Um, so a lot of us kind of use this language of like China being a communist country, but the truth is China is an authoritarian country, but they do have a very interesting and weird uh, sort of state capitalist model, heavy government intervention in the economy for sure, but also um, sort of using, you know, quasi sort of free markets to achieve efficiency. And we'll see why markets are efficient in a bit. These are the definitions of communism and socialism. Cool. And then production and distribution decisions are left to individuals act, interacting in private markets, right? So this, um, and we'll discuss why, um, the free market capitalist economies and mixed economies uh, tend to be very efficient at allocating resources. So we talked about capital as the wealth used to create other wealth. And so in free market capitalist systems, um, since the private ownership of the means of production um, or the means of production are privately owned, um, uh, people um, are assumed, our producers and consumers um, are sort of le left to their own devices um, in this sort of system to um, produce and consume whatever it is they desire. And as they exchange whatever excess is that they produce with another person, um, they are able to acquire different goods, right? And this system we are told is conducive to specialization. Uh, you're gonna produce whatever it is you're good at producing and you're gonna sell whatever it is you're good at producing and you're gonna consume um, um, or you're gonna trade with other people and, and consume whatever it is they're good at producing and all that sorts of stuff in this sort of system, like the ideal typical. Um, we have a mixed economy. We have and we rely on the market for allocating uh, resources and we'll explain why that, that's an efficient way to allocate goods and resources most of the time. But there are these things called market failures, which we're going to talk a lot about at the end of the course. Uh, but um, our economy has a combination of governmental development, free markets with regulation, and other forms of collective control. These are much more conducive, these systems, than these centralizing decision making in a small group or committee. Uh, they're much more conducive to specialization, and specialization 
is very important for increasing the production potential of people and an economy. Cool. So we'll talk about Adam Smith's visible hand uh, when we get into unit three and talk about perfectly competitive markets a little bit. But all I wanted to say is that in a free market system, uh, the theory is um, that there's an invisible hand that develops, that if people operate and are left to their own devices to produce and consume whatever it is they may do, um, this system is more conducive to specialization. It's going to increase greater productivity and, and produ productive potential of people, but it's also um, uh, and it's a system that is fundamentally motivated by greed and the interests and self-interest of people, um, but it's also going to um, sort of, um, um, you know, produce a, 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 a just result, like it's going to produce a socially uh, or welfare maximizing result um, um, by itself. And we'll explain this logic more fully later, but for this to hold, for the invisible hand, as Adam Smith articulates it here, to hold, uh, you need direct competition, low barriers to enter the market, no powerful buyers that can drive your price to negotiating, little control over supplies. We'll talk about this in unit three, and then we'll talk about how this doesn't always hold in unit four when we talk about imperfectly competitive markets. Mm. And so we read Hayek's On Knowledge and Society, and then I ask you to summarize his main points. And one of Hayek's main points is specialization is good. Uh, the free market is good. Free market enables decentralized decisions. And specifically, he says, Hayek says that um, decision making should be made decentrally, if possible, in an economy. And the reason why you are, or when determining answers or trying to come up with answers to society's three fundamental economic questions of what to produce, how to produce it, and who should get it. And the reason why he says that decisions should made, be made decentrally is because he says there's a variety of different things that happen in an economy, right? There's so much information that is that goes on in an economy that is relevant for an efficient allocation of resources um, uh, there may be like a sort of, you know, machine failure in one firm, and that should impact, uh, that's going to impact production. Uh, there may be a shift in consumer preferences overnight, and that's going to impact consumer um, preference decisions and so forth. All that sort of stuff, he says, can't possibly, it would take a lot of time to gather that information, send it to a central committee, and ask them to make consumption and production decisions um, and, 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 and determine how to allocate scarce resources in the economy. And he says that would be very inefficient, and he's largely right. So he says that the way that these decentralized decisions can be made is through a free market system, obviously a capitalist system, where we have private ownership of capital, um, where we have people that are, are, you know, have private ownership of capital um, that are, are producing uh, goods and services for profit, right? You know, kind of relating to Adam Smith's invisible hand and all that good stuff. Um, and so, he, he, but the way that these decentralized information is, or the way that information is communicated from these decentralized vantage points is through a mechanism called price and through price systems right uh, we see this all the time right and without getting too much into supply and demand which we're going to get into in unit two we see that um, the price system is very good at communicating information right if the price of uh, gasoline goes up you don't necessarily need to know that the reason why the price of gasoline went up was because um, there was a war in the Middle East. I mean, it'd be cool if you did know that, but you don't necessarily need to know that. And there's um, different producers and consumers that are modifying prices constantly, right? Their own prices and looking at the prices, um, and we'll talk about, you know, how how different productions or how or our producers may be either price takers or price price makers later, but but they're communicating these sorts of information through the price system, 
right? And maybe changes in how consumers uh, or what consumers prefer to buy, right? And what consumers will ultimately uh, increase consumer utility um, are reflected in the price system, right? We know, for example, Bernie Sanders middens have gone all over the internet. And I imagine the teacher that made Bernie Sanders middens is now, uh, you know, would be wise to raise her prices on those types of middens if she were, you know, selling them for profit. So cool. So all of these stuff, when we talk about all these stuff, we're talking about the efficient nature of the market. The market, free markets lead to specialization. Free markets um, are characterized by the private ownership of the means of production. Uh, they're in contrast to, um, you know, a centrally planned command economies and so forth. They lead to specialization. They're conducive to specialization. And the way that this information, all this information in the market system is communicated about, you know, different um, production possibilities, about different consumption preferences is through the price system, right? And so free markets for the most part are really good at allocating resources. And it seems, and to go into AP government, it seems like laissez-faire economic ideology is for the win, right? A lot of you might think that. This is the logical conclusion, Mr. Diaz, this is it. Well, you know, and this is me not taking a position on this, but, you know, economics is not done, right? There's this thing called market failures, and we'll get to this at the end of the course, where the market does in fact fail. And the market does in fact produce outcomes that are not optimal for society, not optimal for um, you know social welfare and stuff like that. And we'll talk about that at the end of the course. So maybe if you have this ideology, remember we talked about this in AP government, you're feeling pretty good. Okay, Mr. Diaz, I'm feeling pretty hot. And Sure, as you should, you know, the market is an efficient mechanism for allocating resources most of the time, but just be beware that unit four, we're talking about imperfectly competitive markets and unit five or unit six, I believe, we're talking about what are called market failures. We'll get more into that later. What is the role of government in this? Well, the role in government, according to economists, would be in market failures. And we'll talk about market failures later. And um, for the protection of private property rights. Um, I'll include this video about the tragedy of the commons that should make clear to you the importance of private property rights and then therefore the importance of protecting private property rights. The importance of maintaining or getting us out of the state of nature. Remember AP government content? It's coming back to hide us. Remember Hobbes and the state of nature where life was nasty, British and short. Well, and then we entered into a social contract and you know, state and government. Well, yeah, government has a role. And we'll find out later government has a role in rectifying market problems or market failures. OK, now we're getting into production possibilities curves. So we talked about this opportunity cost is the opportunity cost of any items, whatever must be given up to obtain it or the best foregone alternative. That's the opportunity cost. We talked about the opportunity cost LeBron James would face going to deciding to go to college instead of going to. Um, I'm sorry, that was gross, but I am so thirsty because I've been talking so much. But the opportunity cost LeBron may face, he might face explicit costs of going to college, explicit costs or accounting costs of college itself. But economists don't just care about this, right? He might face, you know, cost of books, $500 books, cost of tuition and fees. Economists don't just care about this. They care about the opportunity cost. What did LeBron James give up? To go, to go to four years of college at, let's say, Duke University. If he decided to go to college, he didn't. He went straight to the pros. Well, he would have given up, you know, millions of dollars because let's say he would have been making 20 million. Um, I don't know how much he made in 2003, 20 million dollars per year. You know, a Duke degree, which he probably could have gone to Duke um, basketball. 
is worth what about two million i think over a lifetime right not worth it right the opportunity cost is prohibitively high and so he was rational in deciding not to go to college and we'll talk about rationality and optimal decision making later um, so the production possibilities frontier, we said that it's a, a model and um, it's an economic model. It's specifically a pedagogical model mostly. Um, nobody's going to be like, bro, I need you to draw a production possibilities frontier um, or you're not going to get the job. Now, uh, production possibility frontier is a very, very, it's very, it's a very, it's a simplification of um, the production possibilities um, of a person, business, or a country. And when we're going to use it in this class, we're going to use it to illustrate the gains of trade. So it's a pedagogical model in the in the sense pedagogy means um, um, an approach to sort of teaching and learning. Um, but it's a pedagogical mo model in the sense that it's meant to it meant to teach you a concept about trade, teach you a concept about specialization, teach you a concept about the benefits of specialization specifically. So we'll talk about this in a bit. So to study international trade, assume two countries and two goods, all that cool stuff. So we'll talk about this using um, PPS. Um, so this is an example of a PPF of uh, wheat in tons. We said that you might be forced to graph a PPF, and we said that oftentimes you'll have problems that are going to be like, what is the opportunity cost of moving from E to D? The opportunity cost, again, is the value of the best foregone conclusion. So moving from E to D, it'll ask you maybe, what do you get from moving to E to D? You get 100 computers, but the opportunity cost, you can see, is 1,000 tons of wheat. E to D is a thousand tons of wheat. Cool, 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 cool. It may ask you the opportunity cost of moving from D to E. Um, it's, it would be, of course, from D to E is, what is that? is 100 computers, right? Because we go from making 100 computers to zero computers. Boom. OK, and so linear, this is a, a linear PPF, PPF, production possibility frontier. And this is significant because linear production possibilities frontier have this special idea of a constant opportunity cost. And what specifically I mean by constant opportunity cost is sim similar magnitude movements um, um, along this line. So what I mean specifically, if you increase units from increase production from zero computers to 100 computers, your opportunity cost is a thousand tons of wheat. This because of co the constant opportunity cost means that if you increase production by the same magnitude, 400 computers to 500 comp computers, you should expect the same opportunity cost, which is what you, you have, which is 1,000 tons of wheat. Not all PPFs. This is a very unrealistic PPF. A more realistic PPF would be one that's bowed outwards and one that's bowed inwards, and we'll talk about why they might be bowed outwards, um, but we won't we'll talk about why they might be bowed inwards yet. So, cool. Also, for now, we'll talk about returns to scale when we get into the unit on imperfect competition, but unit three. But just remember that a constant opportunity cost reflects that there are constant returns to scale. Okay. Um, so, A, this is the shape of a bowed out PPF, and this in this PPF of let's say economy A or a country A maybe, and this production possibility frontier of country A, and remember a PPF can be of a country, a person, a, a business, doesn't matter. Um, we can see that there are increasing opportunity costs, meaning that a similar magnitude shift from here as we can see, 
would not significantly impact opportunity costs, right? So we start here, and then we go to this unit right here, and we don't expect a major drop off in terms of, of opportunity costs. However, the same magnitude shift here, so from here to here, we can see a major drop off in terms of opportunity costs and the magnitude of opportunity costs. And the question is why? What does this vote out PPF you know, signify? Well, so at point A, the opportunity cost of mountain bikes is low, as we can see. So do not have, but at point B, most workers are producing bikes. Oh, so at point A, workers are producing beer, even those who are better suited to building bikes, right? And so, you know, giving up a lot of workers isn't going to significantly alter your production. Also, I will say that these PPS assume there uh, assume one factor of production in these PPS. There are different types of models that assume multi multiple factors of production. But uh, I mean, you're you're allocating resources, you know, towards mountain bikes. You're allocating units of labor and all that sorts of stuff. But you can also think of it in terms of of um, you know a, a lot of chefs in the kitchen. Uh, maybe you really don't need that extra labor. Um, you know, producing beer. Like there's maybe a lot of people that are just like so crowded in this this like beer production facility that letting a couple go isn't going to significantly affect uh, your output or production. And maybe you can let like the losers go, right? The ones that really suck at making beer uh, that may be really well suited to making mountain bikes, right? So that's okay. But as you get closer and closer, right, you're really at this point, you're giving up maybe the best and most skilled beer makers and 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 putting them towards the production of mountain bikes. So you should expect your opportunity costs to get increasingly, increasingly higher in this boat out shape. So this is the increasing opportunity cost of a pizza. You can see it here, similar magnitude shifts. Um, and you see that there's an increasing opportunity cost despite similar magnitude shifts, increasing opportunity costs. Uh, before I continue, I, I want to say that this represents increasing opportunity costs and decreasing returns to scale. You can also manage or uh, as a OK. There's also another sort of graph. Looks like this, and we'll explain when you can expect increasing returns to scale. Damn it. Oh, I'll say that. and decreasing OC. This happens in a lot of natural monopolies, and we'll talk about this in unit three, but just know it, just memorize it. So if you're graphing a PPF and they look like that, memorize. Cool, cool. Production capabilities and the shifters of PPF. Oh yes, so we also want to talk about shifters of PPF. Let's see, that's just something right out of pizza. and bikes, shifters of PPF. So at these points on the production possibilities frontier, they're at the frontier, right? And so we should expect that these are obtainable because they are at the frontier, but and efficient. ABC. Right here, that is definitely obtainable, right? You can obtain this combination of pizza making, let's say, and bike production, but you are wasting a lot of resources. It's obtainable but not efficient, right? Four and two. Okay, that's you. You suck. You suck at using things efficiently. It's obtainable, but not efficient. 
And then over here, point E, that is not currently obtainable, but efficient. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. And then when we think about shifters of production possibilities frontier, you always want to think of in terms of, let's let me make this re more realistic. You know, maybe effects on the factors of production, um, technological impacts. Financial services, and then let's see. On this end, I don't know. Let's see. Fully autonomous weapons, so robots. We'll talk about the. We might talk about artificial intelligence later. Um, but so we have financial services and fully autonomous weapons. Let's say that this is a PPF for a U.S. economy. And so. To think about shifters in the production possibilities frontier, we really want to think about factors of production and stuff that might impact factors of production. So, for example, um, this is a Remind me to also talk about something else later. Or no one's gonna remind me. Um, but you want to think about shifts in terms of capital. Um, labor, maybe something happens to the labor so they become more productive or less productive. Um, something happens to maybe the entrepreneurial know-how, which might relate to labor or maybe capital, labor, and natural resources. So specifically with capital, you can imagine a world in which, let's say, um, more artificial intelligence. The United States makes significant investments in artificial intelligence. There's breakthroughs in terms of artificial intelligence. This dramatically improves financial services and fully autonomous weapon systems. And so you can imagine a rightward shift from the production possibilities frontier, right? A capital has fundamentally changed, right? Capital has become um, uh, much more, I, I wouldn't say the, the supply of capital necessarily increased, but like the, the technological uh, or the productivity of capital increased. That's what I should say. So think of in terms of the productivity of these services being affected, either positively or negatively. For labor, um, one thing that might cause a rightward shift in a production possibilities frontier is maybe suddenly uh, compulsory education. Um, education is known to increase the PPFs um, maybe compulsory STEM education, right? This would seem to to dramatically affect, um, you know, STEM is kind of needed for financial services um, a bit less than fully autonomous weapons, but certainly it would affect fully autonomous weapons. Maybe compulsory STEM education, maybe everybody is forced to take pre-calculus and um, engineering in the country, and this could dramatically affect the PPF. Um, entrepreneurial know-how. Um, uh, it's something that I can imagine if this is maybe not a PPF uh, or, or maybe a, or maybe um, I can't really think of a good scenario, but let's say there's um, new, I don't know, an organization model, um, new governmental guidelines, um, less regulation stuff oh, i don't know i don't know what would be a good one uh maybe better new resources um maybe um an increase and in, i don't know what would be a good natural resource like rare earth minerals that might you know increase the ppf a little bit more towards fully autonomous weapon systems all that sorts of stuff might lead to a rightward shift a leftward shift could involve you know um you know a breakdown in capital uh, maybe the United States bans 
the use of artificial intelligence or um, in certain contexts, right? And so that, you know, decreases the productivity of capital, right? Or the productive ability of capital. Maybe um, the labor force, there's a lot of talk about um, how distance learning has, uh, is probably going to have deleterious effects on the productivity of the United States workforce. So we can imagine that, you know, kids that are not doing their AP microeconomics homework or not tuning in for the AP microeconomics class are not going to be as well prepared as other kids. And maybe we say that the, a lot of, this is happening to a lot of kids, and this would be a leftward shift of the curve, right? Um, um, all that sorts of stuff, okay? So think about, when you're thinking about shifters of the PPF, think about in terms of, you know, enhancing or decreasing the productivity of um, one of the factors of production. And that should have an impact. So we can also use the PPF to visualize um, the cost of, you know, consuming a lot of what are called capital goods today and the or consumption goods and investment goods today over um, capital goods, right? To visualize the sort of trade off in doing that. And so specifically, we said capital goods. We talked about capital as wealth used to create other wealth. We can also talk, we can say that these are also investment goods. It's wealth used to create other wealth. So we can imagine if we're producing, I should say, not consuming, producing a lot of capital goods. If we're producing tractors and trailers and um, artificially intelligent, um, I don't know, <laughs> services or whatever, right? We're producing capital wealth that's going to be used to create other wealth. This is going to lead to a more positive economic growth for the U.S. economy, assuming this is a PPF of the U.S. economy, or this could also be a PPF of a business or firm. But right? if that business is investing in capital equipment today, then that's going to lead to higher growth tomorrow. Right. So we can kind of see the temporal trade off. In contrast, if that business is, you know, producing a lot of consumption goods, not really producing a lot of um, capital goods, or that that country is producing a lot of consumption goods and in turn consuming a lot of consumption goods, possibly, um, then that that might not lead to a lot of economic growth tomorrow. Right. And the way what this implies is living on the high high on the hog today implies low growth. Okay, so we can see right here, we're consuming a lot more consumption goods and here's relatively low growth compared to um, a more expansive rightward shift of the PPF of consuming a lot of capital goods. You might also get through what is called capital depreciation um, if you're not, if you're producing a lot of, you know, consumption goods, um, and not producing a lot of capital goods and in, in, in turn your economy consuming a lot of capital goods, you might what gets called with capital depreciation. You might actually get negative growth. So capital depreciation is like you should expect your capital equipment to get run down, uh, to face all, um, you know, deterioration and all sorts of stuff. And so if your 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 PPF point is over here, you should expect even negative growth with capital depreciation. Okay, now we're into comparative advantage and absolute advantage in trade. We talked about international trade. This is sort of, you know, delving into specialization and the benefits of specialization. We said international trade is not very popular in America. We talked about the protectionist policies of President Trump and sort of the protectionist ideologies that exist um, across the political spectrum, specifically more so at the fringe, like towards the far le left. Um, of the Democratic Party, I'm talking about the Bernie Sanders of the world, um, Elizabeth Warrens, and kind of the far right, um, well, I guess now more the mainstream of the Republican Party in, in, in Donald Trump. And protectionist policies, uh, they're not very popular. In, or trade is not very popular. However, there are gains from trade. There are gains from specialization. There are gains um, that can be attributed to comparative advantage. But to understand comparative advantage, we also have to understand what is absolute advantage. A producer of a good has absolute advantage in producing X over a second producer if the first producer can produce more X with the same resources. So 
um, with the same resources, they're more productive at producing X. That means that somebody has an absolute advantage in the production of X. Cool. Absolute advantage is neither necessary nor sufficient for gains from trade. Um, so it's not the big picture. What is the big picture is comparative advantage. That's what we care about. Nobody gives a crap about absolute advantage. And so we talked about this example of absolute and comparative advantage with LeBron James, um, and I'll leave it, uh, or I'm not going to repeat that example here, but a person has comparative advantage at producing something if he or she or they can produce it at a lower cost than anyone else. And so specifically, um, I can do a example of comparative advantage. The principle of comparative advantage, there's a positive aspect to this. And I shall say I shall say this. There's a positive economic aspect to this because this is very much an economic theory and it's a robust economic theory. We're going to use what is called the Ricardian model to demonstrate the gains from trade and comparative advantage, or to demonstrate the gains from trade um, that is attributed to um, um, people or businesses or countries specializing in that which they have a comparative advantage in. But there's a positive economic uh, sort of um, um, analysis predict prediction or description to, to this in the sense that if a country signs a free trade agreement with another country, a economist might make a positive economic prediction using this sort of theory and in this sort of model saying that um, Country A will specialize in that which they have a comparative advantage in, and country B will specialize in that which they have a comparative advantage in. Right? That's a positive economic description, right? And they might use this kind of theoretical model to explain why that positive economic description is true. And there's a lot of support for this. Um, countries tend to um, export that which they are more productive in um, than other countries. And, and and they tend to import that which in which they are less productive than relative to other countries. We'll explain a little bit more, but there can also be a normative economic statement that is said. Um, maybe an economist that you know is kind of ignoring maybe international security implications or maybe political implications might say, hey, the United States really should trade with China and they should you know drop making. Um, you know, steel and they should just trade electric cars because they have a comparative advantage in electric cars and China should trade steel because this would, you know, lead to gains from trade, increase uh, the ability for the US and China to both, um, you know, go beyond their production possibilities frontier um, and, and acquire more, more um, goods. And not acquire more goods, but to be able to make goods and and make the good that they're good at um, and be able to trade that good um, for goods that the other country is specializing in um, at a lower opportunity cost than if they were to make that. We'll, go, we'll get into it. Okay, so this is an example. This is output data. I'm gonna show us a shortcut to find the per unit opportunity cost because we wanna find the per unit opportunity cost to be able to um, compare um, um, countries opportunity costs and to be able to um, um, determine which country has a comparative advantage in the production of which good or service. Okay and so for output data there's this like mental shortcut I'm not going to go into the logic of all of that of, 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 of I'm not going to go into like you know ex extreme details I'm just going to go into the shortcut for this review video output other over. And I'll explain what this means in a bit. What I like to use is every time you're given output data, in the numerator, I put what you give up over what you get. This is the formula for finding per unit um, output. Or I'm sorry, the op the per unit opportunity cost. So per unit opportunity cost is for one bottle of wine, how much cloth do you give up? And the reason why you want to do that is so that you can be able to compare with the per unit opportunity cost of, of France to determine who has the, the lowest opportunity cost and therefore the comparative advantage. So five bottles of wine. So to find the per unit opportunity cost given this, 
You put what you give up in the numerator, so 20 yards of cloth. You don't have to put the units yet. And then what you get, so what you're going to produce and specialize in instead. 20 divided by 5 is 4 yards. So for one bottle of wine, the per unit, you can write it out, OC is four. Oh. But I'm not going to write that out. So it's four. For one bottle, because we can't compare this, for one bottle of wine for France, again, we use the formula what you give up, or the other over, meaning the other in the numerator. So what you give up, we put the 10, sorry, the 10 in the numerator over 15, simplify. Five. Oh, what the hell did I do? Sorry. Two and then three. Two thirds. Cloth. Yards. Did I do this right? Twenty divided by five, ten. To, yeah, two thirds yard. And so who has the lowest opportunity cost, meaning who gives up less? It's France. And so therefore, France has the comparative advantage in the production of wine, kind of a little racist uh, problem. Not a racist problem, but it's kind of funny. A little stereotypical, I mean. And then um, um, four, four yards is a higher opportunity cost than, than um, France's two-thirds yards. And so this means that the U.S., uh, because the comparative advantage, you can have the absolute advantage in both goods, but the, you can only have the comparative advantage in one good. There's some situations where there's no comparative advantage, and we'll talk about that in a bit, and it's just that the slope of the PPF sort of thing. Um, but, oh, or I'm, hint, hint, I'm going to put a word problem on that for the, in the reveal. Um, but I can, I can show you these, but I'm not going to. But you'll see that the opportunity cost um, for the U.S. in cloth is going to be um, um, smaller than the opportunity cost for uh, France in, in cloth. And these are the, actually the reciprocals. So this is three half and four. So it'd be one fourth. So you can see one fourth is actually smaller than three halves because these are the reciprocals. And you can do the little mental shortcut to see that they're the reciprocals. But just know that if you have the comparative advantage in one good, you can do a full stop and find the comparative advantage of the other good. OK. We did input questions. So this is an example of an input question. And for input questions, you can use this sort of mental shortcut, IOU, input other under. And then what I, I would just memorize is that for input questions, I would definitely just put, um, just remember what you get over what you give up. Of course, these mental shortcuts are defined the per unit opportunity cost of a good or service. But first, I want to talk about absolute advantage. Um, so in input questions, you have to be a little bit careful. Um, so in an output question, Whoever has the absolute advantage in something would obviously be producing more units. But in an input question, whoever has the absolute advantage in something is producing um, those units in less time. And so it's clear that China has the absolute advantage in the production of both steel and electric vehicles. But because they only take two hours and four hours, uh, it will take the United States to produce either one unit of steel or one electric vehicle um, to, to produce one of both. But this doesn't matter. This does not mean that you China should specialize in both of these things. 
Um, an economist might make a positive prediction if, the, if, if China and the United States were to engage in completely free trade, uh, that um, you know China is going to um, you know exchange and export to the United States and specialize in the production of that which it has a comparative advantage in, and the United States is going to specialize in the production of that in which it has a comparative advantage in, and all sorts of stuff. Or an economist might make a normative statement saying that China um, or the United States needs to stop wasting resources and and trying to um, give um, steel or, or trying to to special trying to produce steel and, and should just reallocate all resources to production of electric vehicles. Um, oh, but I give I gave it away. So to find the per unit opportunity cost and remember per unit. So one unit of steel opportunity cost is what you get put it in the numerator so what are you getting you're getting or put the the input value of or, or the in here we have like the labor hours it takes to one make one unit good the input value of what you get which is the steel over what you give up which is the electric vehicles Simplify by the four, three halves, right? So one unit of steel, the opportunity cost is three half vehicles or cars. Cool, 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 cool. Per unit opportunity cost, that's what it means. Per unit opportunity cost for China, what you give up or what you get, Four, one half cars. So China gives up a half a car for every unit of steel it makes, while the United States gives up 1.5 cars. And this makes intuitive sense because you can see that it takes that this would make sense because if China were to to you know make one unit, which is what a per unit opportunity cost is, then two hours. They would all. They would only take them two hours, and they would only have two hours, right? And that would be worth half a car, which is lower half or one and a half. The lowest one is half a car, so that means China gives up less. So despite the fact they have the absolute advantage in both, it means that China should specialize in the production of steel, and the United States should specialize in the production of electric vehicles. If you don't believe me that the opportunity cost of the United States is lower than um, China's opportunity cost of producing electric vehicles, please just run it. Do the formula, plug in the numbers. But also know that this is just the reciprocal. Two thirds units of steel is the per unit opportunity cost of producing one electric vehicle and then producing one electric vehicle for China, the opportunity cost is two units of steel, the per unit opportunity cost. And two thirds is smaller than two units. Cool. Okay, let me answer the questions. Boom. Should I do a PPF to show the gains from trade? Should I do a PPF to show the gains from trade? Um, so sort of, I'm going to keep these opportunity costs so you can see them per unit opportunity cost. Um, or no, I'm not going to do show conceptually the game from trade here. I already showed it in class and then it gets complicated and you all get lost and it's not relevant. So rational decision making. So we assume rational decision making. Rational decision makers do what is called um, op or, uh, cost benefit analysis. So they consider the benefits of a choice and they consider the costs. So we said earlier that in economics, there are explicit costs. There, for, there's a cost for going to the movies, the $10 movie ticket, the gas money. There are implicit costs. Implicit cost is probably one of the most important concepts in economics. And implicit cost is an opportunity cost. It's the value of the best foregone alternative. So in addition, so the concept of no free lunch is saying that, you know, you're giving up time, essentially. And so for going to the movies, there's an implicit cost associated with going to the movies. So for example, for me, I can go to the movies or I can teach Saturday school, right? There's a t cost associated with me going to the movies because um, I could have made $40 teaching Saturday school. And that is, 
um, the value of the best foregone alternative. So that $40 would be added to the $10 movie ticket. And that would be equal total costs, so $50. So we have the value of the explicit cost would be the $10 movie ticket and the implicit cost is the value of the best foregone alternative or the opportunity cost, the $40 that I could have made, but I chose not to, that equals the total cost. And so when conducting cost benefit analysis, a rational agent uh, conducts cost benefit analysis um, um, and, and, and makes decisions based on that. And my benefit in theory is supposed to be greater than this $50. Accounting profit versus economic profit. Accounting profit is total revenue minus explicit costs. So accountants are only concerned with explicit costs, but economic profit is always going to be lower than accounting profit because economic profit considers the value of implicit costs. So let's look at an example. Khan Academy, don't sue me. Here's an example of benefits and costs, explicit and implicit. Opportunity cost is the cost of the next best alternative. So in this example, suppose you have the choice between going to a movie for three hours versus working for three hours. Movie tickets cost $10. If you can work $30 per hour mowing lawns, $12 an hour working an ice cream shop, or $10 an hour wedding your aunt's garden, what is the opportunity to cost of going to a movie for three hours? So first of all, the opportunity cost of doing anything is not the sum of all the alternatives that you could have done. No. It's the value of the best alternative you could have done. And the value of the best alternative you could have done is the 30 hours an hour mowing lawn. And we know that we're watching the movie for three hours, so that's $90. So the opportunity cost or the implicit cost of going to the movies is 90 bucks. What is the total cost? Remember that um, total cost is explicit plus implicit cost. And so the explicit cost is 10 bucks. Of the movie ticket, so that's a hundred bucks. Now, an accountant would only care about the ten dollar loss. An economist cares about the implicit cost or the opportunity cost, the value of the best foregone alternative. It's an example of accounting versus economic profits. Every month, you sell five thousand burgers at five dollars per hamburger. She spends two dollars per burger on supplies. She also pays $2,500 per month to two people, and then utilities cost $500. So an accounting profit is the total revenue. Accounting profit is the total revenue, which is 5,000 times five, which is $25,000 minus, and then we know that $2 per you know, hamburger, 2,000 times 5,000 is 10,000. So we're at 15,000, 2,500 a month, 5,000. So we're at 10,000 and then we have 500 in utilities. So we're left with 9,500 in accounting profit. Accounting profit's good, but we care about economic profit. This is intro to microeconomics, right? And let's say that Sally could have worked that she has a law degree and she could have been making ten thousand dollars a month right that's the value of her best foregone alternative at a law firm then her economic profit so minus ten thousand is actually negative five hundred and so um assuming uh, we don't know, maybe she has sort of benefits associated with this, but this wouldn't seem like a rational decision to make, um, assuming that she didn't really care, or she didn't really have a preference for working in a hamburger shop over a law firm, and she was just trying to maximize the economic profit, right? This wouldn't be a rational decision, because economic profit is counts for implicit costs. But if it was like she could have made 5000 a month, then we would just subtract it from 9,500, and then her economic profit would be 4,500. That's how we consider economic profit. So assumptions of microeconomics, this is something I took from Richard Thaler. I'll include him in the video description, a lecture on Richard Thaler. He goes and models of economics kind of assume rationality. Like nobody does this cost benefit analysis explicitly. Nobody thinks like, oh, what are my costs? What's my opportunity to cost? But we do do it intuitively. We do kind of have a sense. We kind of have a rough back of the envelope type assumption. And so these assumptions about, you know, us, you know, being rational agents, it's called homo economicus. Um, but is this a really realistic assumption to hold and, um, um, and to model economic behavior on and to try to predict economic behavior on. 
Um, Richard Thaler argues no, and Richard Thaler eventually won the Nobel Prize. And there's a lot of new research called behavioral economics on this. Um, and he makes this distinction between um, this sort of assumption of rationality baked in a lot of economic theories and how irrational and, and sort of stupid sometimes we can be. He has a lot of interesting research on nudges, which we'll talk about um, at the end of the year. But for right now, we're just going to build a lot of map models assuming rational consumers and rational producers. Cost-benefit analysis optimizations reflects human behavior. There are certain pitfalls in situations in which people tend to apply the cost-benefit principle consistently. We talked about this. They ignore implicit costs. They focus on accounting profits. And then the failure to think at the margin. So sometimes a lot of them will consider sunk costs. So an example would be a buffet. Um, so sometimes there's a $5 buffet fee. And sometimes if that fee gets waived um, um, for like 20 customers, it shouldn't matter. Um, you should still expect the same consumption or, or for 2,000 customers and 2,000 customers have to pay that $5 fee. You should still expect the same consumption patterns because it's a sunk cost. It doesn't matter, right? What matters is decisions at the margin. What matters is decisions at the increment in terms of determining um, the amount of utility you want to get out of something, the amount of happiness you want to get out of something and stuff like that. But Psychologists have shown, and behavioral psychologists in particular point to this, that that $5 actually matters a lot, and that people that have to pay this fee actually tend to spend or try to eat as much as possible at buffets, even though that's some cost shouldn't motivate their eating consumption patterns because they're trying to get the bang for their buck. And people that get this fee waived tend to eat as little as possible or eat much, much smaller amounts at buffets because they kind of want to like not want to impose. Another example is war and conflicts, and so I'm going to go to this because there's a cool Justin Wolfers. He was quoting a Donald Trump tweet and he's talking about the sunk cost fallacy. So sometimes politicians use the sunk cost fallacy. Obviously Trump's Twitter account has gotten um, taken down, but there are other examples of sunk cost fallacies in like foreign policy. So these are examples from Justin Wolfers slides. He's, the, he's a, a fellow at the Peterson Institute of International Economics. He's a professor at the Uni University of Michigan. Um, and so George W. Bush, you can see here, I've met too many wives um, and husbands who will never see their mom or dad again. I owe it to their families who still have loved ones in harm's way to ensure that their sacrifices are not in vain. Obama, you know, uh, kind of talks about the same sentiment, but that's not rational. That's not maximizing. Um, that's not considered rational according to economists. Um, that's not making decisions at the margin. Um, this is a sunk cost. The sacrifices of these these um, you know people's lives and the resources are a sunk cost, and you should make decisions at the margin according to economists. I mean, not all of us are like that, and so there's a sort of Spock-like you know character to um, the rationality models that economists build. But don't worry about that so much. Okay, then we talked about diminishing marginal utility. So we talked about this in class. So we said with each additional scoop of ice cream, you might get a total utility of 60 points, 100 points, um, 120 points, 120 points, 140 points, 120 points, 110 points. And so total utility reflects utility is a concept. So we talked about costs in the cost benefit analysis. Now we're going to talk about benefits in the cost benefit analysis. Utility is a kind of amorphous concept. It can mean happiness benefits um, worth the previous economics teacher called them happiness points. So if you want to call them happiness points, you do, you do that. It's just a concept um, that is supposed to really kind of reveal that there is a lot of subjectivity in uh, terms of what we value and the preferences we value. Uh, there's a whole economic literature or a lot of economic philosophers for a long time were trying to determine what into went into um, the uh, pricing of specific goods and services and they thought it was um, you know the amount of labor and yes labor is important but what is probably also important is just like subjectivity and arbitrariness right sometimes we value very like things that you know don't require maybe a lot of labor to produce 
or don't require a lot of inputs, but we value them nonetheless and we can have eclectic values and maybe even problematic values as well. So um, our utility functions uh, look different for different things. We all value and gain happiness from different things, um, but we assume rational agents are trying to maximize utility. So utility is a term for usefulness, worth, virtue, happiness, and benefit. So total utility from scoops of ice cream, you can see here it increases and then it goes downwards. So right here we said that you're blowing up brownie chunks. You're just eating too many scoops of ice cream. You're not enjoying it anymore. You're becoming miserable. Marginal utility reflects the with each incremental. This should actually be 100 and then 60. So with one scoop of ice cream, 60 utility points to four and then five is one ten. So with each increment, marginal utility reflects the uh, utility gained at the margin or with each incremental unit. So from 0 to 60, the marginal utility is 60. From 60 to 100, the marginal utility is 40. From 100 to 140, the marginal utility is um, 140, or I'm sorry, 40 again. Let's say it's, let's, 130, so I can get get the point. 130 to, what the heck did I do? Okay, forget this. So from 100 to 120, the marginal utility is 20, and then from 120 to 110, the marginal utility is negative 10, right? So with each incremental unit. And this demonstrates the principle of what is called the law of diminishing marginal utility. It represents the law of diminishing marginal utility. Laws in social sciences are not exactly like the laws of, you know, physics, like the law of gravity and all that good stuff, but they are still nonetheless very important. And so the idea of the law, the law of diminishing marginal utility is going to become very important because it's one of the reasons why our demand curves are downward sloping. That means nothing to you right now. It's going to become very important to you later. But it's this idea that with each incremental unit, we may still gain happiness from it, but we become we gain um, our marginal utility decreases. And we should expect this. Um, so for example, too, we can see marginal utility. Oftentimes we'll use extreme examples in economics to demonstrate a lot of laws and principles. And so we can see the law of diminishing marginal utility in income. Um, and so specifically, I want to show you. Um, so in extreme poverty, um, the marginal utility of a dollar is probably extreme. You're probably going to be very, very happy for an extra, extra dollar. This is a beautiful book by Catherine Boo on Behind the Beautiful Ep Forever is about living in a slum in Mumbai. You're going to be really, really happy with an extra dollar, just one dollar, because a lot of these people that are the subject of Catherine Boo's book live on less than a dollar a day. There are about a billion people in the world that live on less than a dollar a day. However, Shaquille O'Neal, for him, a dollar is, this is Shaquille O'Neal's house, a dollar is not going to bring him nearly as much happiness, if anything, as, as, as um, you know, the people that live um, in this slum in, in India. So that's the principle of diminishing marginal utility of income. Um, there's a lot of things, for the most part, that have diminishing marginal utility. And we'll we'll explore this further when we get into demand later. I also just wanted to raise your awareness, and I'm going to put in the description. Um, this is what I'm going to have my AP cohort. You're going to have to read a large excerpt from this if you're in my AP cohort. Depending, and this is going to cover so many cool topics. This is a really cool paper uh, that is really geared towards introductory economics courses in college, um, so uh, undergraduate students um, that talks about the fact. Or, or talks about, you know, not our economic ideologies, but more so um, maybe our conceptions of what would be an, a just economic distribution of resources. Um, and I want us to kind of think about that using, you know, different frameworks for thinking about a just um, allocation of economic resources. And so the law of diminishing marginal utility really suggests um, that, you know, 
to if you're a utilitarian in the sense that you want to increase and maximize the amount of happiness in society, um, then there seems to be a lot of room for dis redistributing wealth at the top end of the spectrum to um, the bottom end of the spectrum where the marginal utility of a dollar is higher than at the top end of the spectrum, right? If you're looking to maximize the amount of happiness in a society, and we'll talk about this, uh, but of course this comes with efficiency costs and um, there are things that we have to consider. Here you can see the utility function of hyper between measured in dollars and well-being measured in utility, uh, the law of diminishing market utility. Um, but we'll talk about this later. I just thought it was really cool to introduce and I'm very excited to talk about it. So right here you can see total utility graphed. We can just imagine this could be the total utility of ice cream. Maybe you have at one ice cream cone here you're blowing up chunks or here you're you're blowing up chunks but I don't know why you're still eating it and then the marginal utility. So the marginal utility is actually the slope of the total utility and the marginal utility you can see is downward sloping. This is going to be so cool because in unit two we're in a diminishing marginal utility is one of the mechanisms for a downward sloping demand curve but not relevant right now. Okay, so we're going to do this word problem. The table above shows Teresa's marginal utility from bagels and toy cars. So we can see the marginal utility. What is her total utility from purchasing three toy cars? So we go to the amount of toy cars, and we know that marginal utility is reflects incremental utility gained. So at 10, a 10 marginal utility reflects the gap between a uh, quantity of cars being zero and 10 and the marginal utility or the the yeah the marginal utility or the incremental utility gained from zero to one and that's ten um, so all we have to do is add up marginal utility to find the total utility and so we add these numbers up ten eight and six and we get twenty four so easy twenty four utils this is a little bit harder and this is where I kind of messed up in class and my apologies I was. I haven't been sleeping very properly, and as you can probably tell, um, you know, teaching. I've been teaching. You have to consider it from my view. And now I'm feeling sorry for myself in this YouTube video, but I have been a teacher for two years now, and both years, um, I decided to move to AP Microeconomics. That was my decision for sure because I love AP Micro. I love AP Government. And I wanted to teach it after I taught AP World History. I wanted to teach AP World. But I've only ever taught a new content. Does that make sense? Like I've taught AP World History and then AP Government and then AP Microeconomics. Like I think I really want to stay one more year um, because I just want to be able to like relax a bit and having taught, you know, or having all these resources accumulated that I've made um, to be able to, to implement. Okay, that's besides the point. So the table above shows Teresa's marginal utility from, from bagels and toy cars. Um, so marginal utility from toy cars and utils, we just add them up, 24, 24 utils. Teresa's weekly income is $11. The price of bagels is $2 and the price of a toy car is $1. What quantity of bagels and toy cars will maximize Teresa's utility if she spends her entire weekly income on bagels and toy cars? Explain your answer using marginal analysis. Okay, so um, I'm not going to get to the explain this part. We're going to do that in AP microeconomics tomorrow, but we have to find to be able to compare these and make sure that we're allocating these $11 properly is we have to find the marginal utility per price. So marginal utility of bagels for the price of bagels. Oh. And then we have to do the same marginal utility of curves per the price of curves. Cars. And so price of cars is only one buck, so it's 10, 8, 6, 4, 3, 2. The marginal utility per price of bagel 
is divided by 2, so you divide everything by 2. 8 divided by 2 is 4. 7 divided by 2 is 3.5. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 5 divided by 2 is 2.5. 4 divided by 2 is 2. 3 is 1.5. Okay, so if we're maximizing utility, we're trying to get the most utils for our bucks. And so what we have to do, and what I for, forgot to do, is we, we have to determine, okay, for each dollar, how much are we going? So for our first dollar, we're going to allocate it to one toy car, right? Um, because one toy car will give us 10 utils. For our second dollar, we're going to allocate it to two toy cars, or the second toy car, because it'll give us eight utils. For our third dollar, we're going to allocate it to six, to or, th or um, the third toy car, because it'll give us six utils. For the fourth dollar, we can allocate it to bagels, or we can allocate it, allocate it to toy cars, which is allocated to toy cars, to keep it simple. For the fifth and sixth dollar, and this is what I forgot to say, because the fifth and sixth dollar, because remember, that one bagel costs, um, you know, two dollars. So for the fifth and sixth dollar, I'll just put two circles or something, whatever you want to notate. We're going to allocate it to um, one bagel because we know, essentially, um, for each dollar that we're allocating, we're getting four utils, and for the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh, eighth, we're going to allocate it to um, a second bagel. Seven, eight, nine, ten, and then eleven. And so the amount of bagels that we'll purchase is three, and the amount of toy cars that we'll purchase is five. And we'll spend six dollars on bagels and five dollars on toy cars. And so how we can explain this is that the marginal utility or the total utility is maximized by um, 